Good afternoon, everybody. This is Andrew Bram. Welcome to today's Pavenar, and it is entitled Foam Asphalt and Laboratory Testing, specifically M sub R, where M sub R stands for Resilient Modulus. If you can't hear me talking right now, please check your computer volume and or speakers. And if that's all fully functioning, I encourage you to go within the Illuminate software on the upper left corner of the program. You can go to Tools, Audio, Audio Setup, Wizard, and then follow the instructions for help. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your electronic hand. If you look on the left side of the screen, just below the list of participants, there's a blue hand with a little green arrow. And if you click on that blue hand with the green arrow, um, it will raise your electronic hand. And then I'll know that you have a question. After that, you can simply type the question into the chat box. And the chat box is located beneath the um, list of participants in the electronic hand. You can type the question into the chat box, click Send, and then everyone will be able to see uh, your question. And I'll be able to either answer it immediately or pause at a convenient time and answer it then. After the presentation, professional development hours will be emailed to you. Uh, that will probably happen no later than this Thursday. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, today we'll be talking about foamed asphalt and laboratory testing. And I'd like to thank um, industry for requesting this topic. This is actually a very interesting presentation to put together because there's really two types of foamed asphalt in our industry. The first is used for warm mix asphalt. So we'll just briefly cover warm mix asphalt and foamed warm mix asphalt. And the second type is using foamed asphalt in either sub-base or base materials. And this is often called full depth reclamation, or FDR. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. I'll give an introduction to the resilient modulus test, the M sub R test. We'll talk some about the equipment that's available to purchase that you can use in the lab to simulate foaming asphalt. And you can see there's three primary um, companies, the Verkin, PTI, and DNH equipment. We'll talk a little bit about foam testing in the lab from a warm mix asphalt uh, perspective and some other asphalt applications. And then finally, we'll end up a little bit talking about some resilient modulus triaxial testing. And that was the um, main question that was asked is about some of the numbers that can be found in literature from the resilient modulus triaxial testing. So we'll finish up with that. And uh, there's two references that I used for that section. One was Kim Jenkins' PhD dissertation, which is back in 2000, and then also a, a Hales and Deneau from Transportation Research Board in 2009. So what is warm mix asphalt? There's actually a complete pavenar on this. You can watch it online through the website. But just in general, it's a, a general term. We use it when we're talking about construction or production temperatures that are approximately 30 to 50 degrees Celsius lower than traditional hot mix asphalt. And it's often called WMA. And that stands for warm mix asphalt. And there's uh, several different technologies that you can use. You can either use an additive, which includes a chemical or a wax. And um, a, a chemical type additive is used for uh, one of the foaming processes, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. Or another way that you can achieve warm mix asphalt is by doing an alternative production process, which we'll also talk about in a couple of slides. There are some advantages and disadvantages to using warm mix asphalt. Lots of people talk about your reduction in energy and emissions, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, respectively. You also have less odor. You can increase the haul distance. Because you're using lower temperatures, you can also extend the paving season. So you can pave a little earlier when it hasn't warmed up as much, and you can pave a little later. One of the primary um, deteriorations of asphalt concrete during production is oxidation. When asphalt cement is heated up to very high temperatures, it does oxidize. So by lowering 
the production and construction temperatures, you have less oxidation. Because the mixture actually has less temperature to decrease, you can we can uh, release it to traffic more quickly. Um, you can compact it easier, and also you can, uh, some people say, use a higher recycled asphalt pavement or wrap content. As far as performance goes, uh, most projects have not seen a decrease in performance out in the field. However, long-term data is not available. Um, you know, the oldest project out there is probably no more than five, ten years old. And um, obviously, the older you get, the fewer there are. So there's really not any long-term data available. And also, one of the findings from an NCHRP study, a National Cooperative Highway Research Program study, which we'll talk about um, in the upcoming slide, is that um, you may need to add some coding, workability, and compactability specifications. So this concept of, of using either a, a new material or a new production process, you may need to uh, introduce some additional specifications as well. So specifically when we're talking about foamed asphalt, um, on the left you can see a picture of a double barrel green. This is an Aztec setup. There's also different types of foaming setups that can be used. But the principles are all the same. And what you do is you inject water and a little bit of air directly into the liquid asphalt cement. And what happens when that water and air hits the asphalt cement is you have a foaming process. The asphalt cement foams and it expands. One way to do this is by injecting water and air directly into the asphalt cement stream. Another way of doing this is to add what's called the synthetic zeolite. And a synthetic zeolite is a material that can capture water. So you have this crystalline structure, very small material, and you can see there in the picture on the right, it's a, it's a powder. But this powder is specially designed to trap water. And when this powder with the trapped water is added to the asphalt cement, it's very similar to the, the um, double barrel green process. But that water immediately evaporates and it expands. So you get a foaming mechanism in that way. And when you're looking at the uh, zeolite, you typically add 5 to 6% weight of the asphalt binder of the zeolite. This is a little schematic of the uh, foamed asphalt process. You have an asphalt cement line that gets forced down where it's connected and touches a little bit of water and a little bit of air, and then it can expand. Now, if you had a zeolite, instead of having a water and an air entrance, you would simply have the zeolite added at that point, and the same effect would happen. The water would immediately evaporate and would start foaming. A little bit of theory behind the foaming process. When the um, water contacts the asphalt cement, as I've been talking about, it does turn to vapor and the bubbles are foamed. Now, when you're using a warm mix plant, it is immediately mixed with the aggregates. And if you have a greater amount of foaming, you're able to betterly distribute the asphalt. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation that foaming is often used in two ways, either with a warm mix process or with a full depth reclamation process. And with the fold up reclamation process, you have some sort of milling machine on a job site. And I apologize, I should have put a slide in for this. But you have a milling machine on the job site that adds the foamed asphalt to the base and the sub-base material. So it's an on-site process, and it usually uses base and sub-base material. So either with the warm mix asphalt in the plant or with the FDR uh, process in the field, Immediately after your asphalt cement foams, it's mixed with the aggregates. And during this mixing, all the uh, larger bubbles burst. And the small asphalt particles disperse through the aggregate. And they do this specifically by adhering to the finer particles. So when you're thinking about either a warm mix asphalt blend or a base stabilization, a base or a sub-base blend, you have a lot of small particles. And these small asphalt droplets then adhere to the finer particles, and they coat the larger aggregates. During the um, foaming process, you have a whole range of size of bubbles 
anywhere from large to small. And it's very difficult to quantify the size of bubbles because it's a, a black liquid entrapping a clear gas. So it's, it's not very intuitive. It's been difficult to capture the size distribution of them. Um, but the larger bubbles are the first ones to break down. And those smaller bubbles allow for a little extra lubrication. And you have the lower production and construction temperatures. So whether you're using a warm mix asphalt application where the asphalt cement is foamed at the plant and mixed with the aggregate in the drum, or if you're on a job site and you have some sort of reclaiming machine, and that reclaiming machine has an asphalt cement nozzle going in with water and air, and that foams and immediately mixes with the base and the sub-base material, uh, both of those use um, the same principles, just at different points of the production and construction process. <clears throat> so that's a little concept of uh, foaming and how foaming occurs. Now, one of the performance tests that was of particular interest was the resilient modulus. And going along with the, um, the concept of having the warm mix asphalt and this, the base stabilization, the full depth reclamation, those two areas, well, you can um, test the resilient modulus in two ways. You can test it in an indirect tension setup that's often used for warm mix. And then as pictured here on the right, you can also test it in a triaxial test for bases and subbases. So for warm mix asphalt, you have an indirect tension setup. So it's a, a circular sample. And you push down on the top and the bottom of that circular sample in an indirect. So you have tension in the middle, compression on the top and the bottom. And that pushes that center out. So you have tension in the middle. Um, for the warm mix asphalt, you can follow ASTM D4123. And you can get a measure of the stiffness of the material. And what happens is you apply uh, one tenth of a second load, and then you let it rest for nine tenths of a second. And you do this over multiple cycles, and you're able to get uh, a measure of stiffness of your mixture. For the base and the subbase, you use ASHTO T307, which is a triaxial test. And you put very, very small strains axially on this sample. And as you put these very small strains on, you keep the material in the elastic phase. So if you recall, an elastic phase is where if you put a stress on a material, you have a constant strain. So if you put a stress on a material or if you put a load on a material, it's constantly deforming at the same rate. And that makes it elastic material. And if you're talking about sub-base and base material, if you want to keep it in that elastic material, elastic range, you have to keep the strains or the deflections very, very small. Similar to um, the uh, warm mix asphalt measurement, you are measuring a stiffness uh, for the base and the sub-base material. And it, you can estimate the modulus of elasticity of your base or sub-base material by using this triaxial test. So that's just a really brief background of um, foamed asphalt in the laboratory, a little bit behind the mechanisms and a little bit then about the testing. If you have any questions, uh, please raise your electronic hand. And I'll wait for you to type the question into the chat box. If there's no questions at this point, we'll move on. So the, some of the technologies I was talking about, the um, aqua foam or the, um, the uh, double barrel Aztec foamer, those are both foaming uh, machines in the field. Now, if we're looking at lab testing, it's very convenient to have a lab testing setup. And there's actually three different primary manufacturers of foaming machines in the lab. Now, the links on the screen do not work. So I'm going to put each of these links into the chat box. And you can look at them from the chat box. The first process is the Verkin foamer. And this was designed for full depth reclamation, or the FDR, using the base and the sub-base layers. The Pavement Technology Incorporator, or PTI, they have the foamer. And this was designed for warm mix asphalt applications. And you can see the link there in the chat box. And then finally, DNH equipment has the Accu foamer. And that was also designed for warm mix asphalt. 
So of the three primary mechan or three primary uh, pieces of equipment that are available in the um, laboratory, two of them were specifically designed for warm mix asphalt, and one of them was designed specifically for full depth reclamation. And we were actually able to purchase both the Virkin foamer and the PTI foamer here at the University of Arkansas. And I was very impressed with Virkin. They were up front saying that this is not designed to be used with warm mix uh, asphalt applications. Um, it's designed to be used with FDR, or full depth reclamation applications. So you have the links there in the chat box. And what I'll do is I will um, go through each of these in a little more detail. And actually, I noticed it looks like the Virkin link didn't quite work. Oh, let's try that again. Well, um, it's not showing up as blue. I apologize if you're not able to click on it and get to the website. It didn't work the first, second, or third time. <laughs> but um, if, if uh, you do want to get the link, you can either email me or I will be uploading the PDF onto the website and you'll be able to get that uh, when you get your professional development hour certificate. So for the Virkin WLB-10S, um, your asphalt cement temperature can be anywhere from 140 to 200 degrees Celsius. You can add anywhere from 0 to 5% water by volume of the asphalt cement. And the air pressure can be between 0 and 1,000 kilopascals. So those are just kind of some broad specifications. It was a little interesting comparing the three different pieces of equipment. All their specifications are written a little differently. And um, I'm presenting the specifications as given by the manufacturer. And they all specify asphalt cement water and air pressure, but they're all written slightly differently. One nice advantage of the uh, Virkin is that it is available with a dual shaft pug mill mixer. So if you're interested in making a, a mixture coming directly out of the foaming machine, um, the Virkin is actually designed to combine with a pug mill mixer so you're able to spray the foam directly into the mix that you're producing. And this machine, even though it was not designed for warm mix asphalt, was actually used extensively in the NCHRP 9-43 project, which we'll get to in the next section. But that's actually a warm mix asphalt project. So we're trying to understand how to simulate the foaming process in the lab. There's a lot of open questions, which is very exciting for us researchers. This is a picture of our machine in the lab. And um, it looks very clean. This picture was taken immediately after it was purchased. If you guys are ever in northwest Arkansas, I invite you to come and tour our lab. And it is no longer this clean. It is covered with asphalt in many places. But I think that's good. It shows that it's being used. But you can see on the right is the WLB-10S. That's the actual foaming unit. And on the right-hand side, you can place water in the asphalt cement within some chambers. There is a, um, an air compressor within this unit. However, we simply hook it up to our lab compressed air. It's just more convenient for us to run it that way. You can see the foaming nozzle. Um, and you can foam directly into a bucket if you uh, prefer. Or you can place it um, into the mixer. And that's an exterior view of the Pugnell mixer. And that allows you to have mix inside the mixer uh, tossing and turning, and directly spray the foamed asphalt into there. The second uh, piece of equipment that you can purchase is the PTI foamer. And um, this has an asphalt cement temperature, a maximum of 177 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of right in between the range of the Virkin. The water is placed into the mixture in less than one cubic foot per minute. And then the air pressure is set at 344 kilopascals, uh, which is less than one standard cubic foot per minute. So you can see these kind of, for the foamer, there's a little less flexibility than the Virkin, but it falls pretty much right in the middle of a lot of the Virkin specifications. So I see Paul uh, raised his electronic hand. So I'll pause a little bit here while he types his question into the chat box.
welcome, Paul. If you're still typing, could you please raise your hand again? And if not, we'll continue on. Okay, sorry, I apologize. I know it's not the most convenient setup to have the um, the type in the chat box, but I learned very quickly that turning on 54 uh, microphones at the same time you can get all sorts of interesting background noise. So to, to mitigate that, I just uh, turn everyone's microphone off. So the question is, how does air get into the WLB-10S equipment? Um, well, as I mentioned, on the right-hand side, I'm going to try and get uh, creative here. On the right-hand side, in this part of the chamber here, there is an actual air compressor in that chamber. And um, there's a small air line then that goes over here to the foaming nozzle. And um, as we saw a couple slides ago, um, that's where the air and the water hit the asphalt cement. Um, what we have, though, it's behind the unit. It's behind the, the chamber here on the right. You can hook up to a, a compressed air line, or you can have an externally compressed air cylinder. And um, that does hook up to a little air line. And then the air simply goes along the back up here to the nozzle and right in this area is where the air and the water and the asphalt cement all come together. And then the uh, foam sprays out through this nozzle. Um, so if there's any other questions, please do feel free to raise your hand. And I'll uh, continue on with the PTI foamer. This is a picture of the foamer. It's, the components are similar to the Verkin foamer. Here you have a um, water and asphalt cement chamber in the very center of the, the picture here. And then at the bottom is a foamy nozzle. So this is also hooked up to our lab air supply. In fact, that's that little cable on the right, I believe. And again, what happens is the asphalt gets heated, um, and then the water and the asphalt and the air all come together right at the foaming nozzle, and then it comes down out the, the bottom of the sole chamber. And if you go to the Pavement Technology website, which is the second link I, I placed in the chat box, you can actually um, see this unit in action. And it comes out looking kind of like chocolate syrup. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, whereas the Verkin, it comes out more of um, um, Gee, I don't know how to describe it. It's a much more aggressive foaming process. It almost looks like shaving cream coming out, but it, it expands very quickly, and it's a very um, aggressive expansion, whereas the, the foamer is more of a, a very slower uh, expansion. And then the third type of foaming machine, the AccuFoamer, um, this is also designed for warm mix asphalt applications. The um, asphalt cement temperature, you have a maximum of 200 degrees Celsius. And you can, any, you can make anywhere between 150 to 6,800 grams of asphalt cement per batch. So depending on how much mix you're going to make, um, you have that range. You can add a liquid additive. It's generally water. The nice thing about the AccuFoamer, though, is you can also add some sort of chemical, if you would like, to help with the foaming process. Um, the maximum temperature of these additives is 82 degrees Celsius. And you can add anywhere between 0 to 9 percent. And then finally, the air pressure is placed at 517 kilopascals. So Jeff had a question. And um, Jeff's question was, with regards to the foamed FDR, what kind of ITS numbers, and ITS is indirect tensile strength numbers, are you getting, conditioned and non-conditioned? And then how about short-term strengths? Jeff, that's an excellent question. So Jeff is asking about some foamed FDR mixtures, indirect tensile strength numbers. Um, and we are actually going to get to some IDT tests, I believe. Let's see, we've got resilient modulus. Um, some of the reports that we're going to look at in the next sections uh, do talk about indirect tensile strength. And I will get to the um, ITS numbers at that point. Now, uh, I ask you, Jeff, if I forget, because it's not in my slides. But if I do forget, um, you can feel free to holler at me electronically and, and remind me. Uh, Janeth has a question as well. Janeth 
question is, what is your opinion about foamed asphalt mixtures used in base and sub-base layers being classified as bound or unbound or weakly bound material? And, and this is a very good question. Um, so when you think about uh, the base and sub-base material using for full depth reclamation, um, that's one of the areas where if you can use foam material to create a, a semi-bound layer. Now obviously if you have a plain base and sub-base material that's unbound, it's just aggregate or um, soils that's completely unbound. Now when you have a foaming uh, mechanism put in there, you are introducing some asphalt cement to the process and it does become in a, in a way a bound material. Um, now, there are some people who believe that you're not actually binding the base and sub-base material. They describe it more as a tack welding. So it's more like you're just gluing them together with little uh, dollops of asphalt. So when you think about foam mixtures, you generally don't have a very um, pretty coated aggregate. It's more um, like pepper colored with these little spots of asphalt cement that kind of hold them together. So when you're talking about um, either being bound or unbound, I would say it's somewhere in between. It's not completely bound, and it's not completely unbound either. So uh, thank you all for those questions. Are there any other questions at this point? OK. Uh, thank you for the questions. Now here's just a picture of the AccuFoamer. Now I have never personally used one of the AccuFoamers, um, but it, it's a, dench, a desk, a bench top unit, so it's much smaller than the Verkin or the PTI. It's made to sit on top of a lab bench. It also has your water and asphalt cement chambers. You have air coming into it, and then the foaming nozzle is on the right side there. So that's a little bit about the background and then lab foaming. I really appreciate the questions during the, the presentation. I think that breaks it up. Um, so if you guys do have questions as we go along, please feel free just to raise your hand and I'll address them as they come. So segueing way now from uh, making foamed asphalt in the lab and going into foam testing in the laboratory, the first project I want to start with is the uh, NCHRP, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program uh, 9-43, which was Mixed Design Practices for Warm Mix Asphalt. And the problem statement read that currently a lot of specifications read that you design a warm mix mixture using the hot mix process all the way to the very end, literally at the very last step you say, instead of using hot mix, we're using warm mix. Um, but there's really no knowledge about, well, are there different things we need to do during the mix design procedure when we're using uh, warm mix asphalt. So the objective of this process was to develop a mixture design and analysis procedure for warm mix asphalt. And as I mentioned, they did use um, some chemical modifications. They did use a little bit of um, uh, wax modifications. But in general, they used a lot of the foaming process, and they did use the Verkin uh, WLV-10S foaming machine, even though it was directly designed for the FDR technology. Now, you can download this document from the internet. I'm putting a link in the chat box. You can click on that link, and you'll download the PDF. And this is a very, very nice report that was done. Lots of information in there, so if you're interested in more details than what I will give, I encourage you to um, take a look at the full NCHRP report. But the summary that they gave, um, there's two ways you can look at this. All of this information is in the report, but also if you have um, access to the AASHTO R35 specifications, there's an appendix within AASHTO R35 that goes over the steps that were recommended out of this project in order to use a warm mix asphalt mix design. So they have uh, several sections, and I'll just very briefly go over each one of these sections. For example, they um, said they're for equipment with designing warm mix asphalt, they recommend a wire whip mixer. Um, 
typically in our lab we just use a paddle mixer, but for warm mix asphalt they recommended the wire whip mixer. When you're trying to decide what technology to use, um, they encourage you to look at all of these points, performance data, costs, production and construction temperatures, production rates, plant, plant capabilities, and then any sort of required modifications should be considered. So um, some warm mix asphalt modifications uh, involve changing your plant, some involve adding a chemical, some involve adding a wax material. All of those has pros and cons. They encourage you to break it down and try and understand some of those details. As far as the binder grade selection, they encourage you to, the same as hot mix asphalt, to follow AASHTO M323. When you're thinking about putting wrap into warm mix asphalt, um, they recommend that the field compaction temperature should be higher than the high temperature grade of the wrap binder. So sometimes using these warm mix technologies, you're actually decreasing the compaction temperatures to the point where they might actually fall beneath the high temperature grade of the wrap binder. And if you start getting into that area, they recommend that you bump the temperature up a little bit so your field compaction temperatures do not go below the high temperature grade. And the reasoning behind that is that if your temperature does go below the high temperature grade, you may not get um, comprehensive blending of the materials of the uh, wrap asphalt cement. They have um, some notes on technology specific fabrication processes, including batching, heating, any sort of additives and moisture and mixtures that you need to, to consider. They did recommend a coating test, ASHTO T195, and that's to ensure that the asphalt cement is heated up to a warm enough temperature or the process is allowing for adequate coating. When you're um, looking at the compactability, they recommend that you compact at the field, com temp field compaction temperature, so in the laboratory with the super paved gyratory compactor, uh, compactor you uh, compact some samples in the lab at the field compaction temperature, and then you compact some samples in the lab at 30 degrees Celsius below the field compaction temperature. And you want to make sure that um, the ratio of the plant to 30 degrees Celsius below is less than 1.25. For moisture sensitivity, they recommend you run T283. For writing resistance, they recommend that you run the flow number test, which is part of the AMPT, or another writing resistant test, such as the SuperPave shear tester, the Homburg, or the asphalt pavement analyzer, APA. And then finally, um, they recommend you contact the supplier if there's any other uh, mixture um, adjustments that need to make per specification. So a lot of these. Um, steps are described very, very well in the 9-43 report. I went over a 125 page report in about four minutes. So um, really brief, really broad overview, but if you are interested, I encourage you to take a look at that 9-43 uh, report, and the link is in the chat box. So we had a question from Jeff, and he asked, is the compaction aids needed or necessary for foamed warm mix asphalt? And uh, the question is, or the answer is, no, they're not necessary. So um, there are some uh, places out there that, that sell compaction aids for warm mixed asphalt, and um, they may enhance the compaction of the warm mixed asphalt, but they are, are not necessary. If you properly uh, produce the warm mixed asphalt and the transit is so, um, the transit of the material is within uh, parameters and it's constructed properly, you should not need compaction, age for, compaction aids for warm mix asphalt. So along with the um, NCHRP 9-43 report, I also took a quick look at the um, uh, NCAT report, the National Center for Asphalt Technology report. And instead of using uh, a foaming machine, NCAT used a asphalt min zeolite. So they used one of the chemical modifiers in order to get the foaming process. And you have the link in the chat box now. 
And um, what they found is that the addition of the warm mix asphalt um, improved the compactability of the mixture in both an SGC, a super paved gyratory compactor, and a vibrate compactor. And they were able to get good compaction as low as 190 degrees Fahrenheit. They did not feel that the resilient modulus was affected significantly. Uh, they did not see an increase in the rutting potential. And there was no evidence of differing strength gain with time. So Jeff had asked a question a little earlier um, about ITS numbers. Now, this is foamed warm mix asphalt. And they found that they didn't see any strength gain over time. So if you foam a sample and you let it sit over time, there's no sort of strength gain. But they did see a little bit of increase of potential for moisture damage. So they did see then the indirect tension strength, the conditioning and the unconditioning samples. They saw with the foamed warm mix asphalt, they did see a decrease in the ability to resist moisture damage. Now, Jeff's question was specifically for a full depth reclamation, but this can give you an idea for warm mix asphalt as well. This is a, a, a picture of the graph in the NCAT report that specifically deals with the resilient modulus. And this is done uh, through ASTM D4123, so the indirect tension mode. And you can see they used a couple different types of aggregates. They used a granite and a limestone. And then they used uh, two different types of binders, a PG6422 and a PG58-28. And you can see um, from their trends that um, using the uh, foam process, they didn't feel really affect the uh, resilient modulus of the mixtures. Uh, they found uh, some other correlations, though. And remember, this is for the warm mixed asphalt. As the resilient modulus decreased, excuse me, as the uh, air voids increased, the resilient modulus decreased. They found little correlation between the air void level and the resilient modulus. And they found that according to an analysis of variance, or an ANOVA analysis, the binder grade had the most significant effect on resilient modulus. And the addition of the zeolite, the addition of the uh, warm mix asphalt foaming additive did not significantly affect the resilient modulus. And the resilient modulus ranged, the values ranged from 200 to 500,000 PSI, or KSI, um, which is approximately 1,400 to 3,500 megapascals. So we uh, went over a little bit of background of the foaming process. Uh, in the lab foamers, we saw that one of the machines we looked at was designed for uh, base and sub-base stabilization, which is what we'll talk about here next. Um, and then the other two are designed for warm mix. Both NCHRP and NCAT came out with some very nice reports that are available for free online that talk about warm mix asphalt and foamed warm mix asphalt. And now we're going to finish up with a, a small section on the resilient modulus of base and sub-base materials using triaxial testing. So the two papers that I found, or the two documents that I found that talked about resilient modulus um, uh, looked at both the uh, mixed design considerations and then the effect of miller uh, mineral fillers or active fillers. So trying to add another material in order to either enhance or change the ability of the foaming process. And these are both for a uh, base and sub-base materials. So the first document that I referenced was Kim Jenkins' dissertation. Um, it's from the University of Stellenbosch down in South Africa. And then the second one was a transportation research record uh, paper that was put out in 2009. So thinking about what the resilient modulus is and how it works, you can see here um, the rectangle in the middle is a schematic of a resilient modulus test specimen. And there's various forces or loads or stresses that are being applied on the uh, material. You have principal stresses, 
cyclic axial stresses, static axial stresses, uh, dead weight stresses, all of those types of stresses. And those are in the axial direction, so they're pushing down on the sample. And then you also have a minor principal stress or a confining stress which pushes on the sides of the sample. Once you get, when you apply these stresses, you do get a little bit of deformation, and that's the axial strain. Now, if you recall at the very beginning of the presentation, I talked a little bit about the resilient modulus and the triaxial test setup. And you want to make sure you apply a low enough stress where you have low enough strains where you're within the elastic range. And if you're within the elastic range, that means your stress history or any sort of loads that were applied in the past does not affect how the material is responding now. So if you push and remove a load, that load will not affect any future loads. And what you want to do is you want to um, prevent any sort of permanent deformation. So as you're applying these very small stresses and you're getting these very small strains, you don't want any sort of permanent deformation. So before I go on, I see that there's a question from um, Judith, so I'll wait for that to be typed in, uh, because this is a, a pretty critical uh, point here. So the, the question is, is can this process be used to repair an already laid surface? Um, and then also, as air temperatures drop, does the, production, uh, does the product become more brittle? So the first question, can this process be used to repair an already laid surface? Uh, yes, you can have a foamed, um, uh, a foamed, the FDR process can either be all base and sub-base material, or you can have a little bit of uh, surface layers. So if you already have an existing roadway, you are able to use um, the foaming process in order to uh, create a new comp one single layer uh, pavement structure. And then the other question is, as the temperature drops, does the product become more brittle? Um, I think that a, a better way of, of saying that is, as the temperature drops, the product can become more elastic. So uh, asphalt cement, as one of the benefits is, is that it does deform under loads. And as the temperature drops, it deforms less and less. It becomes more elastic. And the same type of thing happens with um, the FDR, or the asphalt foaming process. Um, the second question is, is there any specific protocol for the resilient modulus of foamed asphalt mixtures? Well, the, um, unfortunately, the only, AS, the only standard out there is ASTM, excuse me, I'm going back in my, my paper slides here. I know I had it somewhere. Um, there is a, a standard that is out there. It is ASTM D4123. So ASTM D4123. Um, that is the specific protocol for resilient modulus of foam asphalt mixtures. However, that has been withdrawn. It was withdrawn in 2003. And as far as I know, there is no current um, specification that's used. However, this one is still being used in industry to capture resilient modulus. So now we have a little bit of setup of the resilient modulus in the triaxial test setup. So um, Kim Jenkins, he uh, tested a couple different materials. They're called G1 GAU and G1 EER2C. These are just two different types of granular materials. And he had different confining pressures. So sigma 3, if you recall, that's the pressure that comes in on the sides of the triaxial test. So as that side pressure increases, the resilient modulus also increases. Also, as the uh, principal stresses, and those are the stresses coming down on top of the sample, as those stresses increase, the resilient modulus also increases. In this graph on the right, you can see on the top of the top graph is 0% binder. So there's no sort of binding agent in there. It's just the, um, uh, the granular material. 
And then on the bottom is a 2% foamed binder. So they added 2% foamed asphalt into the mix. And you can see as you add the asphalt, the um, slopes of the lines change. So if you have the same um, confining stress, but you increase the, ax or the uh, axial stress, you have a higher rate of increase of resilient modulus. And also, overall, the values are um, a little higher as well. This is the resilient modulus with and without the binder. The top is with no binder. The bottom is with 2% foam binder. And this is the resilient modulus with and without cement. The top graph is 2% foam binder. So this is the same as the previous slide's bottom graph. But then if you add cement, you can see that the values of resilient modulus increase a little bit. Uh, in general, the values of resilient modulus are generally between 150 to 400 megapascals in this study. And that has the three different confining pressures and then um, a very large range of principal stresses as well both with foam, without foam, and also with cement and without cement. So before we get on to the next paper, we had a question from Janeth asking, can we not use AASHTO T307 for the resilient modulus of foamed asphalt mixtures? And that's not, um, well, you can use that test method. So let me see here. Um, we have ASTM D4123, which I typed into the chat box. That was designed for asphalt mixtures. And then AASHTO T307, that was designed for um, a base and sub-base material. And in theory, you can use AASHTO T307. However, you would probably need to have higher um, confining stresses, higher principal stresses, and I actually don't have the, the specification on hand. I don't know if they have limits within those specifications. But because you're using a bound material, you'd actually have to have a much higher um, uh, capability of both axial and um, confining pressure in order to use AASHTO T307. And a lot of these uh, base materials and sub-base materials are run using uh, plastic. Uh, sleeves. But I think if you tried to use that with uh, warm mix asphalt, which is slightly higher uh, binding and higher strength, you would probably need to actually get a metal triaxial cell. All the triaxial testing I've seen with asphalt materials is in a metal cell. So I think in theory you could use AASHTO T307, but you may need to make some modifications on it in order to successfully run um, foamed warm mix asphalt. So the last uh, paper that I'm going to, the last topic we're going to go over is the uh, influence of active fillers. So thinking about foamed FDR mixtures, adding Portland cement, which was done in the previous study, but also some other materials, such as cement kiln dust, or CKD, hydrated lime, or fly ash. Now um, Judith asked earlier, can this process be used for to repair an already laid surface? This is a good example of a study that used material that was 75% deteriorated asphalt concrete and 25% reclaimed granular base. So it was probably either, there's probably six inches of asphalt and two inches of granular base. They mixed that all together and they foamed it, added a little bit of active filler, and ran these tests on it. And they ran this in a triaxial sample, 152 millimeters in diameter, 305 millimeters in height. They used 3% asphalt foam and 2% active filler. And you can see here um, RM, that stands for resilient modulus. It ranged from anywhere to 400 to 1600 megapascals. The cement provided the highest resilient modulus. The cement kiln dust was the second highest. Uh, those are the little um, crosses. The lime was the third highest, which is the circles. And then the uh, fly ash is the X's, which was the uh, lowest with an active filler. 
Now they did do some with only asphalt, so no active filler, and you can see those are on the very bottom, the little uh, diamonds. Um, so the resilient moduluses, they ranged from 400 to 1600 megapascals, and that's using a confining pressure anywhere from 20 to 140 kilopascals, and then anywhere between, um, and then various levels depending on whether it was modified with cement, uh, cement, kiln dust, lime, fly ash, or asphalt. And then um, just as a, a brief summary, the influence of the active fillers on resilient modulus. Um, the Portland cement filler can provide almost double the stiffness versus fly ash, and then the active filler increases the stiffness anywhere from 10 to 100 percent depending on the type. Also, um, after moisture conditioning the samples, so this is where they use the T283 procedure. Uh, they didn't run the indirect tensile. They did not run the indirect tensile strength, but they ran the conditioning procedure on the triaxial samples. About 60 to 80 percent of the stiffness was lost. So, uh, a question from Camila is: Does the foamed mixture used as a base material? works similarly to a cold recycled mixture using asphalt emulsion. Well, and this is uh, quite the debate. Um, so thinking about asphalt emulsion stabilized mixtures versus foamed stabilized mixtures, in principle they're both doing the same thing. They're applying or they're allowing for a little bit of um, uh, binding of particles. But the process, the way they go about it, is very different. Asphalt emulsion coats the entire particle, whereas asphalt foam kind of provides that tack uh, welding. So it's just these little dots of asphalt that holds it together. Now, when you're thinking about, in theory, these base layers should be fully confined on both sides and on the top and the bottom. So the ability for it to self uh, be self-cohesive may not be quite as important as the surface layer. Um, but yes, to answer your question, the short answer is yes, both foamed asphalt and asphalt emulsion can be used um, for cold recycling mixtures. So in summary, we're getting um, pretty close to 1 o'clock. So um, the professional development hours will be emailed to you after the presentation. And they should be emailed to you no later than Thursday, May 9th. It takes a little time for me to get the session back and make sure I have everyone's name and contact information. If you're interested, at that time, when I send out your professional development hours, you'll be able to rewatch the Pavenar through this website. Also, I highly encourage you, if you have any topics, please submit them via the website. The next Pavenar will be Tuesday, September 5th. And the topics will be posted by August 2013. And an email will be sent out to announce the fall series. And just a heads up, I'm a little nervous, but we may be using a new software next fall. Evidently, the software that we're currently using is no longer supported uh, by the university, which means that if it falls apart, I'm not going to get any backup help. Um, well, they always help me, but it may not be as comprehensive as it could. So we may have a new software, so I encourage you to go through the tutorial before trying to log on, because a couple things might be a little different. Uh, there are two topics that have been uh, suggested for next fall. One is the use of recycled asphalt shingles from processing through plant production. That's been requested by industry. Nevada DOT has requested information on stress absorbing membrane interfaces, or SAMIs. So um, if you're interested in either one of those, please keep a lookout. Some other possible topics, these are ones that I thought of, are the development of stresses and strains in pavements, new development in airfield pavements, and then high wrap in asphalt concrete. But if you guys have topics that are interesting, please submit topics that interest you, and I'll make sure they get on the agenda. So I've got a couple of uh, questions already lined up. Um, but using foamed asphalt in the laboratory testing, you got a little bit of the background, some lab foaming devices, a little bit about warm mix, and then a little bit about base and sub-base stabilization using uh, re resilient modulus. So if uh, you need to get going, I understand. Please have a great summer. And if not, I'll stick around until all the questions are gone. 
So the first question is from uh, Sue. Her question is, I am not sure if filler fully characterizes the effect of cement in the mix since it has mineral and chemical reaction in the mix. And that's a very good point. So uh, during that last paper, we looked at four different types of uh, fillers, Portland cement, cement kiln dust, hydrated lime, and the fly ash class C. And they actually did term it as active fillers. And I believe when they were talking about active fillers, that meant um, the active portion is the uh, chemical reaction, and then the filler portion is the mineral uh, portion. So you have both the active chemical, filler, physical. So both of those are kind of acting at the same point. But that's a very good point, and I, uh, you can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the next question is, do you know of any FDR projects, full depth reclamation project, that use wrap and sand? And that's a, a very uh, open question. I do know of FDR projects that have used existing uh, asphalt materials, which after it's milled up is essentially wrap. And a lot of those did have base and sub-base materials, which may have had sand in them. One of the difficult things about full depth reclamation projects is as you're moving down a road, if you're uh, reclaiming to about eight inches deep, your pavement structure can be anywhere between one to six inches deep. I've been on roads where it's been that big of a variation. And then your base courses can also have variation. So you may actually be hitting some uh, sub-base material, which could have sand. So I think that, um, yes, there, there have been FDR projects that have wrap and then also have sand. So the next question is, during the FDR foaming process, what about the safety aspect of using hot AC binder in the field? And this is a very good point. Um, so if you are using a, a foaming process in the field, that means that you will have a tanker of asphalt cement, and that asphalt cement will be at um, you know, 300 degrees Fahrenheit because it has to be fully liquid. There's a hose going from that tanker to the reclaiming machine, and that reclaiming machine then combines the asphalt cement with the water and the air, and the foaming occurs. Having that um, tanker and then a hose going from the tanker to the reclaiming machine, that hose has 300 degree Fahrenheit asphalt cement going through it. So if something does happen with that hose, you could potentially have very hot asphalt cement being sprayed um, outside of the reclaiming process. And I think um, that discussion has also taken place when comparing chip seals using hot asphalt chip seals versus asphalt emulsion chip seals. If you're using hot asphalt on the job and you need to pump it from a tanker to a distributor, from the tanker to a reclaiming, yes, there's always a danger of having um, has asphalt cement. Uh, Jeff followed up with who is liable for that, the contractor, the agency, and that I do not know. I think that would have to go down to the specifications and the, um, the bid documents and any sort of contract that you have when you get into the liability of equipment failure um, during a, a job. And then there's uh, one more question lined up here. Uh, the literature of a foamed asphalt mixture shows a range from um, a few hundred megapascals to 15,000 megapascals. And I did look for those numbers. I was not able to find any um, I was not able to find any literature that used foamed asphalt mixtures and had modulus of a, or, um, resilient modulus of 15,000 megapascals. The literature that I found pretty much made the entire range, which went up to about 1,500 megapascals. So um, the question is, is the, this uh, person has seen literature that goes up to 15,000 megapascals? I have personally never seen that. And I agree that that's getting into the value of hot mixed asphalt. So um, I'm not familiar with that. If you'd like to send me the document that has that, I'd be more than willing to look at it. And we can communicate over email about that. But I've never seen a 15,000 megapascal foamed asphalt mixture. And then um, a follow-up question to that was, 
in relation, does the higher end modulus value suggest foamed asphalt mixture behaves more like a bound material? Oof, and that's a very difficult question. Um, I do think that from a resilient modulus point of view, as those numbers get higher, it's acting more like a bound material. But then uh, Jeff Weitzel, for example, mentioned the um, indirect tensile strength test. I think that if you really want to understand how this material is behaving, you want to look not only at the resilient modulus, but you also want to go beyond and look at some other tests, maybe um, a rutting test, a moisture damage test, something like that. Because I think that the concept of a bound material um, with fully coated particles, that's a much different um, type of material than these uh, foamed asphalt mixtures, which is the, the tack welding type material where things are kind of glued together. So the last question, I'll, um, as, as I mentioned, it's past 1 o'clock, so I'll understand if people uh, start getting off. But there is one more question. And the question is, if foamed asphalt mixtures are considered a bound material, will the heating of aggregates prior to mixing with foamed asphalt possibly lead to mixture problems like stripping and so on? Um, well, I, first of all, I'm not fully convinced that foamed asphalt mixtures are a fully bound material. I don't think that's a, a completely answered question. And I'm, I'm kind of using the, uh, the excuse that more research could be needed to understand how that um, fully um, occurs. But now when we're talking about foamed asphalt, when uh, your aggregate comes in to a uh, warm mix asphalt plant, and if you have water in your binder, could that possibly lead to stripping problems? I think that is a concern. However, I don't think it's been noticed enough to make it a, um, a large scale concern. I think that I am sure that there are foamed asphalt projects out there that have had stripping problems, but I don't think it's been significant enough to um, raise any permanent red flags. That looks good. I think that's all the questions. Again, if you do have more questions, please feel free to stick around. But if not, have a great summer. And I hope to see you guys all next September when we start back up again. Thanks a lot, and take care.